Um, so thanks, Mayert, for, for joining us today. Um, pretty last minute too. And he's like, yeah, I'll do it. No problem. <laughs> this is awesome. So I'll just uh, start by introducing Meyer to the group in case anyone doesn't already know him. So Meyer is the founder of Vaulty and is a rising figure in digital credentials and trust space as the chair of the outreach expert committee for the Digital Identity and Authentication Council of Canada, easier to say DIAC. <laughs> he has led a charge in focusing on user adoption and has continued to writing, uh, contribute to writing the ethical use of biometrics for the Digital Governance Council as well. And with a background in financial services, investment banking and game theory, that's an interesting one, Meyer's expertise led him to recognize the potential, the potential of digital credentials in combating fraud. He holds an MBA from the Rotman School of Business and an honors BA in economics from York University. So welcome, Meyer, and I will just turn it over to you. You can um, share your screen and uh, kick off the presentation whenever you're ready. Sounds good. I'm actually really looking forward to this. I don't know half this room, uh, which is really cool for me. Awesome. Um, yeah. All right. Can we see a screen? Well, we're a small group. If if anyone, if if you guys all um, don't mind saying hello, Meyer can uh, kind of see what you're interested in and, and maybe adjust accordingly on the fly even. I will attempt to. So um, okay. I'll call on, um, do you know Claire? Have you met? Uh, I don't know Claire. Hi, Claire. Nice to meet you. Hi, Meyer. Great to meet you. My name is Claire Nelson. I'm the executive director for the Decentralized Identity Foundation, DIFF. And I've got a long background in cybersecurity, privacy, and identity. I've also done many deep dives into the topic of biometrics. I've given talks on biometrics. I was in a keynote on biometrics. I took a deep dive into BIPA. Um, Christoph Bush in the EU is one of my heroes in the world of biometrics. You, you're nodding, you know who he is. And, and so I'm just fascinated, but I don't have the time now to keep up to speed on what's going on. So I'm just all ears and can't wait to hear what you're going to talk about. Awesome. And maybe I'll call on um, Corrine now that she's finished drinking. <laughs> I didn't want to oh, have her mid drink. Yeah, I actually do marketing and account management at Balti. So okay. I think we briefly crossed paths last week, Bonnie, at the um, DIAC AGM. Oh, nice. Or, no, or perhaps it was Excite. I don't Maybe, recall, yeah. But I'm awesome. seeing a familiar face. So, cool. Yeah. And yeah. yes, I'm from ID Lab. I'm based out mm -hmm. of Toronto. I'm one of the co chairs of the Interop group. Um, Frank, do you want to say hello? <laughs> no. Okay, maybe Charles? No worries. Uh, oh, there's... hi, Charles. Hi. Uh, my name is Charles Lenhan. Um, I am mostly just interested in uh, trying to move my career. I was a data scientist but I, by title, um, uh, but I've been trying to move my career in the identity space. I did a lot of cool projects in my last job uh, in stuff like this. And so I'm just here to learn and <laughs> see what's going on at Diff. So. Great. Okay. And Frank's not in a good spot to speak right now. So we'll, we'll get started. Right. We'll turn let's, it over to Meyer then. Let's go. So um, I'm in a little bit of a different ballpark than I think a lot of people here. Um, I came to this by accident. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got there today. Uh, just going through the agenda quickly. We're going to be talking about the prisoner's dilemma and fraud, uh, which is a game theory principle that I think becomes the use case. Uh, for credentials in the real world. That's how we think about where we target uh, for business opportunities with Vaulty. Uh, we're gonna talk about our solution, how we came to it, why we came to it, the tech choices we kind of made along the way, and then our approaches to interoperability uh, and how we've sort of gone about it. Um, four years ago, I didn't know a thing about interoperability. I didn't know a thing about credentials. I barely knew a thing about blockchain, uh, except it was what some of my friends used to buy drugs. Uh, but, or at least crypto, but in coming to this, um, I, I was involved sort of in my first, we'll talk about that in a second, actually. So a bit of background about me, I'm a founder of Vaulty. Um, we use verifiable credentials as a form of signature on documents. Uh, we allow people to apply their credentials to documents so they can be better verified, uh, allowing us to do higher risk documents for people 
and being able to prove specifically uh, that a real person was in a real place when they signed a document. Um, so you actually know who signed it. So it's a combination of biometrics, it's a combination of credentials, uh, it's a combination of document management. Outside of that, I am the current OEC chair, and I think I can now officially say the last ever OEC chair, because we're getting rid of it. Uh, it's becoming the adoption committee uh, in a couple of months. Um, but before all of this, um, I was an investment banker, uh, purchasing Jacob Securities um, early on in my career, and my undergrad is in economics with the specialization uh, in game theory. And that's kind of where we start talking about the problem. Um, about six years ago, I was involved in my first lawsuit, and someone presented a document to me that they said I had signed. Um, I had no recollection of signing it. It was a document signed document. Uh, I didn't know how it was going to hold up in court because I didn't know anything about it. And I started digging in on digital signatures. Uh, what was a public key? What was a private key? How did this work? Why was it acceptable in court? And what we really got to was there was really no way to prove that. DocuSign was sort of saying, my email address did this. And that got me thinking that it was really easy to commit fraud. Uh, and then if we didn't sort of deal with something on that level, we'd be opening ourselves up to really big problems down the road. And it turns out we did. Fraud is a huge problem um, in North America. 2019 to 2021, obviously our famous pandemic years, um, increases of financial fraud based on digital signatures, based on identity fraud, were increased that 159% year over year. You'd think that would have gotten better post-pandemic. It didn't. Uh, it went up 200% last year. It tripled. Um, and the reason was, was we don't have the protections that we need when we're signing things that we can really trust our counterparties when we're dealing with problems. And this isn't just contract signing. This moves on to a whole bunch of other digital assets as well. We can talk about this with smart contracts. We can talk about this with NFTs. We can talk about this with fine art. Um, there's a story from a couple of years ago uh, where an actor in the US paid you know, millions of dollars for this board eight NFT that was promptly stolen from their wallet. And there's no documentation that can link his digital asset into a physical world where he can then go see somebody in power. Uh, so the assets just gone. Um, as a result of this, JP Morgan, when they were doing their assessments on DocuSign, said that solving that problem alone would increase the TAM of that entire business, which is the total addressable market, by about 25%. So we're talking from 25 billion to about 32.5 billion. So there's 7 billion just sitting in that like secure space of signing docs supposedly and all of this relates back to building trust um and it's funny because when you think about the background of economic history a lot of the problems that we have solved for already why we have things like central banks why we have things like certain laws that require how we trade are in order to increase trust in the economic system and credentials are one of those ways that we can build trust and solve problems in those regards. So let's talk about the prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma is one of the first problems you're going to handle uh, in game theory uh, and in economics. It's a famous problem that basically says you have two criminals. They're both caught by the police. And they're separately interrogated. And they're given a choice, right? You can either confess to this crime or you can deny the crime. And the outcomes are going to be decided based on how we determine what happens. If you both confess, we've got you booked. You're going to go for five years a piece in the slammer. If you both deny it, we're not going to have enough information to convict either of you. And we can only put you away for free. But if one of you confesses and the other one denies it, so I'm going to throw the book at the guy, and they're going away for 10 years. 
This is a really famous problem that's brought up by John Mack in 1994. We've seen the movie Beautiful Mind, it's huge. And it's the cornerstone to most business problems that we're dealing with in digital life. In this specific case, your decision depends on the other person's decision. You have no way of dealing with the outcome, right? If I choose to confess, at the best case scenario, if the other person denies, I go free. At the worst case scenario, if they confess about five years. If I choose to deny it, I risk that the other person on the other side knows I'm going to deny it and they go away scot-free. So the math says that even though the best outcome here is for both of you to deny it, you will both wind up confessing. You both wind up at a worse equilibrium than you do should you be able to communicate with the other person and know what they're going to choose. And this is a game that banks, insurance companies, healthcare, immigration, legal, all play every single day. Um, if you want to take title insurance as a big example here, they're betting that the person who's actually buying this house isn't necessarily a fraudster. Now, on the whole, they're right, usually. Um, but part of their pricing goes into the fact that they have these expected losses of, let's say, a million dollars for every hundred mortgages. The better they can trust the people that they're working with, the more they're going to make, and the lower prices are actually going to be seen down by the insurance side because they're going to be able to mitigate this risk. This happens on the same side with immigration or banking. Uh, we're talking to banks right now about being able to trust the people who are coming into a country so they can open up bank accounts for them respectively. If there's a fraudster, they will stand to lose money. If that person denies, they're going to lose money. If they can communicate and actually be in sync and know who they're dealing with, we can all move to that better equilibrium. So we wind up being in a safer space by being able to trust people. And that's kind of how we started thinking about the business cases here is, where are these trust problems and how much are people willing to pay for? Uh, if you want to take the title insurance specific, specific case, if they have a million dollars in fraud, so let's say every thousand people, how much are they willing to pay to solve that problem for a thousand people? Is that five bucks a head? Five thousand bucks to save a million dollars makes a lot of sense. So now we're going to start talking about how we kind of got our solution. It was, to start, I didn't know a darn thing about identity, but the lowest common denominator for verification is the document. This is how a majority of industries talk to each other, right? When law talks to insurance, they're sending documents across. When banking talks to healthcare, they're sending documents across. When banking talks to insurance, they're sending documents across. Every way we saw it, it's the lowest common denominator of trust was when a company is sending a document to the other. We knew that that's kind of how everyone talked. The question we then asked was, what actually needs to be in place in order to trust the document in every given scenario? Um, and what pieces would we need to make a good solution? Now, I'm not, again, this was five years before I knew what identity was, but we had to start thinking in those ways. So what pieces would need to be in place? And we knew that it would need to be a silent solution. We knew that it would have to have biometric signatures um, in order to be able to prove that somebody specifically and not their other uh, was being able to sign it. We knew that it would need to have decentralized storage. We knew that it would have to have free and easy verification. When you put all these pieces together, this starts to look like what a verifiable credential can do a lot of times. And this is actually where we got to. Um, and from that angle, as we started doing our research into it, we came upon W3C, we started realizing that this was the road we went down. But all of these three pieces were there. That picture over there is actually from the first slide I ever built for Vaulty before we knew what we were doing. Um, that's me trying to explain a credential without knowing a darn thing. Um, but we knew that it needed to be there. We knew that this was sort of how you could verify it. Um, 
the three pieces that we kind of landed on at the time were blockchain, biometrics, heavy encryption, and then the credential kind of tied it all together. So in terms of the actual uh, credential asset, I'm just going to the notes here a little bit. Uh, so the first thing that we realized was it had to be easily verifiable. Verification first, viewing data second. Um, and when we first started with this, we realized that everybody needed to be able to actually verify it. So all of our credentials were verifiable using W3C methods. Um, even if this made the file larger, it didn't matter because it meant that standard libraries were going to be able to verify it. It meant that even if a custom library was required to parse the subset of the data, it would be able to do it. Um, and then we also sort of worked within the next sort of stage on that, which was using a decentralized ledger at the get-go. Uh, we used Polygon for the most part, but then what we called failing gracefully on the inside. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were failing gracefully and failing with the standard HTTP, failing with the website. Uh, and that meant that our public keys and our schemas were also stored to the HTTP. Um, and this was done so that this meant that the documents were published on the website as well as the blockchain, but only the documents and the references to them. So we can sort of get this. This allowed us to provide a decentralized approach for those who are actually valuing the privacy and decentralization, but allowing any user to be able to verify using a standard HTTP. When we were, again, first starting this out, our concept was, you know, person prints out a document that says that they can travel with a child, uh, which might have been signed by a lawyer. They're going to walk into an airport in God knows what country, and that guy's going to say, I've never heard of Valti, I've never heard of potential. How do I verify this? Um, and we're going to show you a little bit of proof on that later on. The more credentials you create, though, the better your ecosystem gets. And when we first started with this, we were on Ethereum. Ethereum got really expensive really quickly. When we launched in 2019, uh, it was the same time that the gas prices decoupled from the American dollar. So in a span of two weeks, our forecasted costs went from 2 million to 142 million. Uh, so we switched to Polygon. Um, but that decentralization again, uh, yeah, Ethereum was expensive, we moved to Polygon. Uh, and this way we can sort of include those public keys within the multiple networks on our credentials. Officially, we are blockchain agnostic, uh, but Polygon's kind of default at least for everybody. The uniform resource identifier, URI, always needs to, is, is always a URL in this case for public information. Uh, in that, we know that private keys are also extremely easy to create. This creates a separate private key that's capable of decoding each credential for public consumption. Uh, the same private key that we use to identify and encrypt information. This is the exact same private key uh, that we're using to identify and encrypt information for users. Uh, in terms of JSON LD, if we can keep everything JSON, we got to keep it JSON. Um, we use JSON LD specifically in this case for our credential schema. We use JSON for our web encryption, uh, our encryption on managing keys. Um, again, this makes files larger, but much more interoperable and human readable, which was kind of ethos was verified over everything. Um, it's really difficult to present an unknown binary file to a programmer and help them understand how to read it. With JSON, because it's human readable, Googleable, AIable, um, it needed to be the language we sort of used to talk to everybody. Um, and then the last one that is that binary data needs to be treated the same. So the ones and zeros here are identified to be true. The ones and zeros can be converted into the use of something that they can see. This helps us keep things W3C compliant, but also allows us to support any file type. So talking a little bit about our credentials approach, we have to actually start from that side again. Credentials aren't tokens, right? They can't be double spent. They can't have transferred ownerships. Um, so these are actually really optimized uh, for the data that's available for most people on most of the networks, but not again transaction speed. We then picked out W3C open ID. We knew that, that was going to be really important. Uh, in that, we also contributed to the Merkle Group 2019 signature suite, uh, which was proposed to W3C um, and is a well-accepted piece, although I don't think it's not it's not a standard at this point. 
Um, and then from there, other approaches we have were keeping it, keeping that data processing in the browser. Uh, everything we write here is in JavaScript. Uh, and that means that the user can process everything on their own device. On the user level, this means an increase on the user level. The logic behind this is that the increase in speed, that like 10% cost, was not worth getting you to install an extra application. Uh, we're going to talk about user adoption in a little bit. Uh, we sat down with literally a thousand groups to figure out what was going to happen. And this was one of those key trade offs that we actually picked up from. On the blockchain, though, storing data gets really expensive. Um, having the user being able to carry their data in the wallet and then their phone, as opposed to storing it encryptedly in IPFS or the cloud, seemed to be the better choice for us. We do use IPFS as a last resort if a user can give information to the verifier that's in their wallet and have them provide that bandwidth. We can reference back to it. This reduces our costs, uh, but allows us also to work with larger files. So if we need to transfer bulk files, let's say, from company to company, we would give them access to a cloud bucket or IPFS. It's easier to work with a communication system. OpenID and Aries are both great for this. Um, than it is to get people to adopt your own solution. Um, interoperability is about communication. It's about being able to work with people. If we're making closed systems, verifiability is not really providing additional security. Oh, there you go. User adoption, journey. Am I on slide 17 already? It's possible. Um, talking about user adoption, we sat down for about a thousand users. And the first thing that we actually learned from people is that the user can't use their wallet. They're not going to. Um, our first hundred tests were just people sitting there quitting all of the time. Um, and we've seen this happen a lot also with other demos where people actually show their wallet, there'll be a crash, there'll be something else that disincentivizes people effectively from using their wallet down the road. Um, the main thing that we learned in here, I don't know how to say this nicely, Users are dumb. Users are really dumb. Um, and that's not to say that we don't know how to use a wallet. I know that us who are developing them all have a pretty good idea, especially us in the credential space. But when we talk about the use of digital ID, we're going to be talking about people who are not attuned to what's going on in the technical world, right? Your grandmother is going to need to use this for her healthcare in five years. Your mom's going to need to use this for healthcare. Your dad's going to do this for all kids in five years. Um, how are they going to interact with this? How are they going to present that credential? Um, if they couldn't use it, it wasn't there. And it kind of went back to our ethos here, which is that interoperability needs to be really easy for even the base user to understand on that side. Um, and in that, when they were doing it, we also saw studies coming and saying that, you know, the average Canadian wants control of their data. The average Canadian wants, you know, perfectly cyber secure things. They were answering that and they were great answers, um, but they didn't always know what those meant. And if it meant sacrifice of convenience, some of them actually weren't willing to do it necessarily when they were actually sitting there and this. Um, those parts kind of worried us a little bit. And that's why we spend way too much time focusing on user experience, on signing on our wallet. Um, as opposed to sort of like the technical real pieces of, you know, building the wallet for the internet, all of those things. And then the last one was that aligning people's adoption. Um, at the end of the day, your users need to be able to actually understand what you're doing. Uh, they need to understand why you're doing it. Um, and if they can get on board with that use case, then they're actually going to sit there and be willing to adopt. If you just say, hey, I have this cool wallet and you can use it to, you know, Prove your age, they're going to say, Well, the driver's license in my car in my wallet. So, why is that benefit there? Why is the alignment better? Um, if you can align them to a use case, which I think you can do on the business side a lot and do them on the government side, it makes it way easier to adopt. And we saw the adoption coming up from that farm. Talking about our approach to interoperability. <laughs> um, We've got a little bit of a QR code here. You can actually verify a contract that Corinne and I signed uh, earlier on. It's a test contract. Uh, this is verified in the failed HTTP scenario. 
Um, but the premise here was that interoperability really needs to be easy when everybody understands how it works. Um, we don't mind when people are sort of copying each other's code. We don't mind pasting codes. That's why I'm in the wrong spot. Okay. Um, focus on the use case first. Load first. Talk about interoperability is so important. Um, in that regard, oh, sorry. There we go. Sorry about that. Let's restart that. Documents. I lost three lights up. I'm good at this. Um, focusing on the use cases, low first is really important in the scenario. User needs to be able to sort of operate everything. If you've got that, the rest is going to be explainable as long as you sort of take that interoperability second, but at the same time, focus on it. It's important. It's not urgent scenario. Um, so in that regard, as long as everyone understands how it works, a programmer doesn't mind copying and pasting each other's codes. Um, so the QR code is what's verifiable, not the document uh, in the printed version. So for the original user, they're actually going to go out and sort of print that document. They're going to be the ones walking into the bank. Um, they're the ones caring about it. So we start focusing on larger cases, of documents, um, as opposed to like an NDL, which is only like three or four pieces of information, gets a little easier. Um, shareable code examples. So this is going to be way right back. Shareable code examples. So we can actually get people to get the information that they need from us. Um, being able to willingly submit that, being able to willingly get that across. Uh, we picked Unicode over ASCII in this case. Um, we thought Unicode is actually a really important part to interoperability here because it has all of the extra characters. We can support things like French language characters, uh, Sorrel characters, other things aside that ASCII kind of gets locked in in those 128. Uh, this means it's going to be easier for us to sort of interoperate not just with Canadian credentials as they sort of go along, but with sort of like larger European credentials as those sort of come through. Um, Unicode makes this a lot easier because it's a language that everyone can speak. Uh, and then collaboration. So on top of sharing code, on top of making sure that everyone's got easy access to what we're doing, on top of trying to make things in such an understandable manner that everybody can actually do everything, it's looking for reasons to collaborate. One of the really cool things that we're seeing sort of within the community right now is that everybody's got their own interesting really use case. And it's oftentimes that when we are combining those use cases together, we're going to be able to find better projects that we can all work on. Uh, I can't tell you who we're collaborating with in some cases, um, but you know, there's certain things that are doing payment rails or certain things that are doing insurance rails, where after on the document side, when we can pair together with that, A, we can test against each other, uh, and then B, we can actually make everything better. And I really do believe in this case that the rising tide raises all boats especially this year, because I think we're going to be moving towards these cases. Um, that was really wrong. What's next? Part of wisdom. Takeaways are, how are we solving trust problems? Um, how is your company solving a trust problem? Who's going to sit there willing to pay for it? Um, really make sure that you've got a use case. We sit in on way too many company presentations that they're really willing to show us their cool wallet or their cool credential, but they don't quite have somewhere where they're going to put it. What problem is it solving? Why is someone willing to pay for it? How's it going? Um, build in a way that you can communicate with everybody, uh, both from an interoperability standpoint and from a user standpoint. Um, I can't stress that better enough. I, I wish I didn't go to my notes on it. I just spoke hard on it because I would have done a better job of it. But just build so that everyone can verify. If we're playing with an open hand on trust, everyone's actually going to be able to see what we're doing. Everyone's going to be able to trust it. We can move forward. Predictions, I think the next 12 months, we're going to be focusing a lot more on use cases than the tech here. Um, not just all TI, I think that's a community thing. Um, you know, we just saw the creation of an adoption committee in DIAC, which is going to start getting going in September. I think we're going to start looking at a lot more adoption cases coming up. We're seeing more and more people come out with products every single day. Um, and over the next three years, I think we're going to see a lot of consolidation. 
in that regard, um, mostly towards standards. I think one of the really cool things about having everybody get their tables, both in the diff um, and on the back side and on a bunch of others, is that this free exchange of ideas is allowing us to narrow in on what are actually best practices, what are actually best languages, what is actually best for interoperability. As we get closer to that, we're going to start outdating some other models that already exist. And in that regard, I think we're going to see some companies wind up validating the others. And I think you'll wind up seeing that a lot of the current projects are consolidating to get closer to that. But for us, our next year, it's going to be collaboration. Always looking for people to play with. Uh, I know we're having um, a couple talks about doing some open test benches. Uh, we're hopefully going to get them. Um, and then piloting. We're going to take those use cases that we've already thought of. We're going to put them into the ground. We're going to see what we can do and see if we can actually make money in this profit. Sort of make money in this field because we know that there's a possibility. We know that there's cross problems. Um, it's just going out and actually bringing the people in the um, That is the thank you. I'm going to open up the questions. Um, I've got a really thick skin. And I don't always think that I get the best problem explain. So uh, go nuts. <clears throat> Sarah's got her oh. hand up. Hi, great talk. Thank you very much, Meyer. And yeah. um, if Diff can help you in any way, please let me know. We're doing guest blogs. This is an open invitation to anyone. If you have a production use case, then send me an email. I'll put it in chat here. Yep. It's Claire at identity.foundation. I'll put you in touch with Damien Glover. He is our senior director of communications and he will interview you and then write the blog. It's painless, it's easy. And, um, and also if you wanna discuss use cases at another time, um, open invitation if Diff can help you in your journey at any time. So I have two questions I'll ask one now then I'll circle back after everyone else has asked. So my first question is, um, what's the business model for Vaulty? You so rightly in the, these la the last slide brought up monetization. Um, if, you're, if you're comfortable, if you could share Vaulty's business model, that'd be very interesting. Yeah, so, so there's a couple of different models that have actually gone out and that's because I think when you're building an early stage startup, you have to experiment and you learn to fail. Um, we have four different models out there right now. All of them are acting in different ways. Um, our earliest lowest hanging fruit that we thought would be able to claim were lawyers. So our major credential is that signing credential. So we actually did that. We also put out a credential that is capable of doing a notary seal. And we sell that to lawyers in Ontario and the rest of Canada in three different models. One is subscription-based. Uh, they get a certain amount of, you know, ver of credential issuances per month. One is bulk-based. They get a certain amount of you know, verifications per year. Uh, and then the other is pay as you go. Um, and that's a little bit cheeky because um, lawyers often will disperse services they use for their clients. And we have a theory that that divorces them from the price, but it's that it does. So that's three times the price of anything else, but it's actually used. Um, so that's what we offer to lawyers. Um, in terms of sort of like the enterprise sales, when we're talking about actual credentials across each board, um, we still do bulk issuance. Um, we charge on issuance, not credentials, not verification specifically. I think there's two models to really monetize a credential scheme, and that's either on issuance or on verification. A lot of the guys out there charge on verification. I don't think that's a sustainable model long term, because when you talk about identity, um, let's take the MDL for example, right, which has a birthday, a name, a driver's license. Your average bar in Canada is not going to pay for a verification of an MDL for somebody's over nineteen. That verification needs to be free. So, in the same vein, nobody's going to pay for the verification of a document signed on Vaulty. They don't know who Vaulty is. They don't care. If I make it as easy as scanning a QR code and they can trust it, perfect. So in that regard, we charge on issuance. Um, but then from that from enterprise sales, um, we're going to put that engine in a car and then 
if we have to build something around it, we charge an implementation cost. But it's usually the same entity in every run. It's still the same verification scheme. Thank answered. you. Should yeah, that was, weirdly that was no, that was well, good. I, I like your multi prong model, but thank you very much. Yeah. The only thing I would add, I don't know if you not necessarily didn't say it, but I think one of the reasons we think that model works well also is that it encourages reusability, right? So, yeah. not only in the use case that we're talking about for this specific client at this specific time. But in the future, as we expand into other sectors and, you know, it's less about documents or contracts and more about credentials that can be shared and reused, that model, you know, holds up better. Yeah. That's actually a really important point. If, if you want to start thinking about how traditional identity works, um, I'm not charged every time I pull my card, driver's license or health care to wallet. Right? I can't be. It's public good. It's really important in those regards. ID kind of can't really do that way either. Um, and that's why I don't love that model. I know there's a lot of Canadian companies uh, and US companies that do operate on that model. They're going to make a lot of money really early on. The long term, they're going to get beat by the guys who are for free. Um, I got a really thick skin. You can ask me about anything. It looks like we also have a question in the chat from Frank. I should have wondered in the chat. Uh, where is the chat? Because I'm sharing my screen, I can't do it. Um, I can read it. What are the information or data points stored in the credential? What part goes into the wallet and what to on the blockchain? Um, okay. So on the blockchain, the only thing that we're storing is references to the credential. The credential is kind of everywhere else. Um, so the credential is still stored in the wallet. We can refer to it on the blockchain and sort of go from there. Um, I know Matt's not here and he's kind of the best one to answer that usually. Uh, I would have pointed him out. Um, on the blockchain, it's just references. So we can point to everywhere else and we assemble it in a verifiable presentation. The actual credential is still going to have the information that you've got. Um, because I've got kind of multiple bases that I can show on a verified presentation. Um, the HTTP model is only going to show the selfie that was taken at the moment of signing, and it's going to show base information about the person, no different from like a Facebook profile would. And then from a verifiable presentation standpoint, that's going to get reassembled into more information that you might need. So that could be your KYC information or your IDB information. Um, assuming you've given consent for that to go across. Um, the original document, uh, which I think is also the HTTP version, because uh, you'll have that from original. Um, hope that answers the question well enough. All right. Uh, what other questions do we have here? Sorry, I need to drop. Towards uh, email, Frank, everyone, one information from the data sort of in the credential that goes into the wall. Yeah. So we got there. Um, Frank is saying thanks. Uh, great. And, uh, and Claire, her second yeah. question. Oh, yeah. Sure. My second question. So I um, this was so impactful. I, I wrote it down. So you said the average person says, says, they want privacy and security, but won't necessarily sacrifice convenience to get it. I am so guilty of that. Take Facebook. I am no fan of Facebook at all. I mean, I come very close to dropping out all the time, but I've got dozens of cousins. And the only way I stay up to date on family and these cousins that are spread around the globe is Facebook. Mm -hmm. and, and so I stay. So I'm as guilty as anyone else um, can you speak more on that and, and on what you see in terms of making it easier for people not to be so conf conflicted? I'm going to give you two horror stories. <laughs> Actual horror stories. Um, the first was our fifth user test. It was a 68-year-old woman who we literally got off the street to sign a contract on Valky for the first time. And when she realized that she had to upload a photo of her ID, I had to sit there in silence and watch as she uploaded her passport to Facebook, 
downloaded it onto a computer, which I was already impressed that she was able to do, and then uploaded the volume. That was just the sequence that she knew how to do that. In, right? Makes perfect sense because that's probably when she uploads photos is to Facebook. Yeah, like it, it made sense, but it was just like horrific. Uh, oh, I know. Oh. Um, the second one is actually worse, which was early in our days, we got contacted by a lawyer who wanted to try what we were doing. And he said, I'm going to use this for a real estate deal. And he's verifying the identity of his client and he won't verify. Tesco's canceled. Tesco's canceled. Tesco's canceled. He messages us on intercom. He goes, what the F is going on? And I go, we took a look at it. I go, well, this is a complicated scenario from an IDB perspective. We need to have uh, a look at this. And in our heads from our test, it was just saying, failed, failed, fraud, failed, like all of them, uh, all of the red flags. And he goes, well, I've got this deal closed in two hours. So you fix this. This was, this was not fixable in two hours. Um, I can't fix a big passport in two hours. Um, so we had caught the better mouse, but this guy wasn't willing to use it because it wasn't convenient for him. Uh, and at the end of the day, he signed his stuff on DocuSign instead of us. And on Monday, got a call from the police. Not from us, because he, he reported it. Um, basically, what we had done was we went back to one and said, look, we tested this thing five times. We're getting all red flags. We don't think something's good. And he wound up, you know, dealing with the police. He called the consulate. He had them check it in. It was a fake Indian passport that somebody had uploaded. And this person had just committed a real estate fraud. And he was warned about it. Um, but because the tech was complicated, because the process was complicated, couldn't meet their deadlines, they weren't willing to use it. They had no obligation from the law society. They had no rules against this. They were good with what they did and did it. Um, it's not enough to make the most secure tool. It has to be a tool that people are willing to use. It has to be a tool that people are willing to trust, right? When I call that lawyer and I say, hey, I've tested this thing, it's not okay. They have to be able to know that they're like, oh, I guess they did their job. They don't want to do that. Um, but these cases are happening, right? There's a reason why most people use a document design, which is still great for 95% of business. It's not something that I want to bet my house on or my life on or something bigger than that. Um, but it's, it's expensive. I, I, I pay every month. I see all of the diff bills. And I'm alarmed at our DocuSign bills. And they want us to sign up for more envelopes. You get this quota on the number of envelopes in DocuSign. I'm, I'm now curious what your pricing is, but I'll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like it's, it's a thing. Um, and it's funny because like, I think they're about three bucks an envelope, if I remember right. And when we first started this, when we were on Ethereum, uh, it was costing us 12 bucks to put everything on blockchain. Um, and that was, I mean, we talked about that in terms of interoperability, in terms of how people use the product. Um, if we didn't move to Polygon, uh, if we didn't sort of move through the product was following and spreading less data on chain now, it, it's impossible. Uh, I would have, like, we did the math, we would have lost $142 million in our first year. And that's with like a thousand sales. Like we didn't even need to do a lot. Um, but yeah, like there's, we're still storing things in places, which means that there's, there's actual goods cost, which happens now in SaaS, which didn't really happen before. It used to be that if you had a SaaS company, you would assume ninety percent margin. No, there's there, there's cost of putting stuff on chain. There are. Um, minor costs, there are gas costs, and stuff goes up. I have costs of goods sold as a SaaS company, uh, and the government hates it because they've never seen that before, but uh, it's there. It is. but And some of the things you mentioned made me think of scale. So I, I must confess that I'm an ex-Amazonian. I've worked for AWS. And so whenever we do anything, um, we ask many questions, but we always ask, how will it scale? 
So it seems like um, a lot of, from just what I can glean and maybe can add more, much of what you're architecting is designed for scale. Yeah. That was, that was the premise. I didn't, I didn't want to be signing the occasional real estate contract. I want to be issuing 50 million prescriptions a month. Beautiful. I want to be, I want to be the guy. When you think about document volume, we produce way more documents than we produce somebody else. We produce yes. more documents than we produce health cards. And, you know, it, let's take that insurance use case alone, right? There were 400,000 homes sold in Canada this year. Every one of them had documents involved. Um, if you want to talk about refinancing mortgages, there were another 2 million of those. Every one of those also had multiple documents involved. If we can create a credential that can be reused to sort of take on a document use case, create a wallet where you can store all your most sensitive information, um, you're in great shape down the road because now nobody can access your documents except for you. You're gonna be able to have anyone you need to be able to verify and verify them because they are linked directly to you. And you're producing way more scale than I think the average digital credential holder is, which is usually for access to one use case. Can this person drive? Does this person have access to an office? What I want to do is does this person have the authority to sign this document? Yeah. Thanks for that question. That was a really good one. Um, I have a, I think we have time for questions. So um, I'm really interested in, in um, you mentioned that this year it's going to be a lot about collaboration and also pilot. So um, if there's any types of pilot you can share that you might be embarking on and and um, you know, I love hearing your user testing stories. Do you think that some of those will will be packaged and shared? And you know, or, or any tips about running pilots in your experience? Love to hear more about that. So I'm always really hesitant to share my user stories. Um, I did them on this call. Uh, I'm definitely not going to write them down. Uh, and the reason I'm not going to write them down is it's going to sound so jaded and arrogant. <laughs> Um, when you sit down with a user, you actually walk them, download your wallet, or sign a document, or, or present your credential, or issue a credential, what you're really getting is the most useful feedback and IP you're going to receive as a company, mm -hmm. right? Because you know now how they interact with it. The reason I'm not going to write that down is I definitely don't want them to ask them. Uh, that, that, that's, that's hard pressed luck. And, Look, there, there, there's people on my staff that don't know that just because, like, you actually have to sit there with the user and walk how they do it. You can you can communicate what you saw and how you saw and what you learned. It's hard to communicate the feeling of, you know, watching a 79-year-old grandmother of six nail it on the first time because you finally iterated your user experience to a point where they can do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's really cool to, it's really frustrating to watch, you know, a 26 year old you know university student download your wallet completely get the credential right nail it and then realize that you know they uploaded the license to instagram which happened like six times um but in those user stories in those user experiences those are the technical know-how those are those are the battle loops that the right. mm -hmm. uh, writing those down is just giving it away in the competition mm -hmm. And it's scary. In terms of pilots, I can talk about. Um, I don't think there's anything signed yet that I'm not under NDA on. Um, but what I can say is uh, there's three or four in the banking space that we're looking at that are probably going to be done in the next six months. Um, there's a much larger one that I really want to be talking about. I'm like super excited about it. I can't. <laughs> But I believe I will or maybe more broadly, is it more like consumer based or business use cases or or that type of more B2B to C. I see. Products. Okay. Um, right. It's it's a business trying to figure out how they can trust their customer. Great. Um, and that could be, you know, someone who's a new to Canada. Right. Uh, which is really great because in that case, you know. I can get them services before they land off a plane. Right. Um, which is really cool because when you think about most people who immigrated here, they came with nothing. So to be able to, you know, have someone land and know that like 
their health card scenario is already taken care of, or their bank account's already taken care of, or they have a place to live because they're living or they live across from them. Those use cases are at least. Uh, we're really excited about those. Um, but in most of those cases, it's B to B to C. Um, there's another cool one, which I know there's been a lot of talk in the news about the Utah Pornhub scenario for uh, IDV. Um, the long and short of it is you actually think about that problem as a whole. I think it's actually really bad for Utah. I think it's bad for digital ID, and I think it's bad for Pornhub um, because it's really easy to Google, you know, foreign pornography, and then you're fine. Uh, we're working on a use case right now with someone that has monopoly in a different controlled space. Um, that uh, if if we can get this done, it would be a really interesting use case for that because you can actually quantify uh, what it's doing in terms of reducing fraud, reducing fraud attempts, uh, which I'd be really excited about because one of the hardest parts about quantifying fraud, and I think it's something that all of us struggle with, is that the purpose of fraud is to actually get away with it. Do you want to file the numbers or are all Great, thank you. I would the only thing I would add to that, I would say, is I think one of the other conversations we've been having a lot lately is where we've ended up uh, as a result. So starting out in documents and evolving into verifiable credentials allows us to do things like zero knowledge proofs. But business people don't care about zero knowledge proofs. They just they want to understand like what um use case or problem we're actually solving so those are the kinds of conversations we're having okay so you know how can you have a i don't know meyer likes to use the word oracle you know but a, a fraud you know oracle in the middle of financial institutions that aren't allowed to share data with each other um you know that that or personal information so things like that which are a bit maybe forward thinking future Maybe not there yet, but there's a lot of scenarios in a lot of different sectors that that could work. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I'm going to add to that, because it's funny, because I didn't realize this until I had a conversation with Justin when he came on. Um, six months ago, if you asked me to do this talk, I wouldn't have done it. Uh, <laughs> I like to think I'm the stupidest person in the room. I am the stupidest person in this room. <laughs> um, but the technical side always freaked me out because... I didn't come from identity. I didn't come from payments. I came from looking at a use case and trying to figure out an answer. Um, and as a result, I assumed that, you know, I basically put together my car with duct tape and screws and it's running, but like, what I didn't realize is that there's some stuff that we had figured out that we had to approach in a different way because of our use cases. So zero knowledge proofs is one of them. Revocation is one of them. Um, where we didn't even think it was a big deal that we could do them. And then as soon as we started talking with them, we were like, wait, you think you're fine? Um, and, and that was kind of an interesting scenario too. Claire, I see you got another question. Let's do it. Yeah, I'm dangerous. I always have questions. I worked for a startup called Sedici many years ago. They're based in Waterford, Ireland. We were doing privacy preserving authentication using zero knowledge proofs. They later moved to an MPC, multi-party computation model. But I'm a big long time fan, especially as a math major of zero knowledge proofs. So my question is, are you um, using what Polygon is doing with zero knowledge proofs? Are there other ways you're using zero knowledge proofs? Uh, that's a question that I really wish I had an app on the phone for. Um... So I can, I think I can sort of answer that, but I do think that we need, would need Matt to dive into the weeds, but I, from what I understand, we're not using, we're only using Polygon as the public chain, not the ID product. So uh, we have our own, you know, method using the W3C verifiable credentials to, to, to accomplish zero knowledge proofs. Okay. So I bring that up. So at DIFF, we have a group, it's the BBS working group that's working on ZKPs, your knowledge proofs. And when I was at ETH Denver in Colorado, March 1st, I went to an event called DID Day. A whole, whole day was devoted to DIDs and Polygon spoke and they're using zero knowledge proofs too. It's rampant, it's all over. Um, adoption rates are, are really taking off. But I, I, was just, I was just curious how, and you probably have many answers to it and we'll have more answers in the future, but I salute you for using that technology. And I see we're at time almost. I'll pass it to Bonnie. Reel well, us in. 
Great. Well, I'm sure we can connect offline. There's lots of uh, good bits from this presentation that we probably want to continue on. So thanks again, Meyer, for joining us. This is great. I really enjoyed it. And I, I think the audience is as well. All right. So thank you. And uh, we'll hope to see you soon. Pleasure to meet you all. And thanks for having me. And uh, we'll go from there. Sounds good. Right. Thanks. Thanks. thanks.